Are you being gaslit or actually getting good advice about exercise for sleep apnea from your doctor? Because when I'm speaking with people about sleep apnea, I hear it too many times. They go to their doctor, get told to use a CPAP or try to mouth guard, and then the following happens. Well, have you thought about exercise? Maybe you could lose a little bit of weight. But when you're there, it almost feels like you're being insulted because you just told this person you're tired and the idea of even getting through a normal day, whether it's work or just things around the house, is nearly impossible. How the heck are you going to exercise in any meaningful way when you are so exhausted? And they make it seem like it's this pyramid scheme. Oh no, you gotta put energy in <laughs> to get energy out. But the thing is, what if your doctor just did not know some of the biggest mistakes and the biggest tips that actually make exercise one of the best complementary add-ins to overcoming sleep apnea. What if they just didn't know the important details? So that's why today I'm gonna to go over some of the most important information that you're gonna get about exercise, improving sleep apnea, and of course, improving your sleep quality as well. We're gonna cover a lot of great information here today. Just as an overview, we're gonna dive into the research, get into how it works, and get into how you're gonna work it here with some sample routines. So we're gonna look at what is known as a meta-analysis. It is the gold standard of studies. It's when they take a lot of different studies, and in this scenario, they took nine randomized clinical controlled trials and combined the data to see what the overall picture is. It does not get any better than this level of evidence. And we're gonna do everybody's favorite thing, which are forest plots. You have probably no idea what the heck that means, but that just means we're looking at the statistics and being able to see how things look overall. So this very first chart, don't freak out. Stop freaking out. We're not gonna go into chi-square and all that. Just look over here. So what this means is the change in sleep apnea severity as measured by AHI. That was the number you hopefully got from your sleep study. If you have mild sleep apnea, you are somewhere between five and 15. If you have moderate, you're somewhere between 15 and 30. If you have severe, you're greater than 30. Now, when you look at these studies, exercise on average will lead to a reduction in your AHI by eight. This is great news because that is enough to knock you down one category. What I mean is to go from severe to moderate, moderate to mild, mild to no sleep apnea. Now that's great by itself reducing the severity of sleep apnea, but we wanna look at as many metrics as possible. Now this next one's really important. It's when we look at BMI or basically just weight because no one's changing their height in the course of these experiments. And if they are, we have bigger problems, okay? They are cutting off people's feet or stretching them out in some way, all right? So this is basically weight. What you can see, again, focus here on the black diamond, it's near zero. It's pretty much overlapping zero. And that means there was no change in weight. Now, if weight loss is one of your goals, okay, that may not be the thing you're looking for, but the point I'm trying to make is that you do not need to lose weight to experience a significant and meaningful reduction in your sleep apnea severity. You don't need to wait for that. You don't need to lose the 40 pounds before you're like, golly gee, I can sleep again. You get the benefits, and I'll talk about why in just a moment. We'll talk about how this all works. You get the benefits before the weight loss. And now the next few factors, we'll just sprint through them because they're not as important, but nonetheless, it increases your oxygen saturation levels, it decreases your sleepiness during the day, and also improves sleep quality. The first thing that we haven't covered yet is that combining aerobic and resistance exercise, that we'll talk about what that looks like in a moment, that is the most effective thing to do is combining both of those, and I'll show you how in a meaningful way in a few minutes. And then of course, I wanna reiterate, you do not need to lose weight before you get the benefits, okay? So how does this work? Great question. How does this work before we talk about the best timing and the best things to do? How it works is that when we're looking at some of the major factors in sleep apnea and how they relate to exercise, it's going to come down to your upper airway function the amount of fluid and where it is in your body, I'll explain that one, your body composition and also comorbidities. And we're actually gonna skip body composition because I just told you that doesn't need to change before you see the benefit. And also, if you do lose weight, yeah, it's gonna help with sleep apnea. Although there's other factors and more nuances to that, that's a separate video for a separate day. Upper airway function, think about it. 
if you're someone who you're running or you're doing some cardio or doing some high intensity interval training, you're going to be breathing harder and faster. As a result, that is actually going to strengthen the muscles in your airways so that at night they're collapsing less. That's how it's going to help. And another thing is that when you do cardiovascular exercise, it's going to improve your breathing mechanics a little bit at rest. What I mean is if you're huffing and puffing, doing cardio, you're getting your heart rate up, it will actually reduce the rate at which you're breathing outside of that because overall, your cardiovascular system, including your lungs and your heart, is more efficient. As a result, you breathe more efficiently, you breathe slower. And when you have a slower breath, it's steadier and that helps keep your airways open at night. Next, rostral fluid shift. Everybody's favorite thing to talk about at dinner time. Honestly, I don't think most people have heard of this <laughs> ever once in their life. But this is simply referring to the shift in fluids in your body during daytime and nighttime. During sleep, the fluid in your body is going to go more towards your head because you're laying horizontal. During the daytime, it's going to go down to your feet. Here's where exercise comes in. If you're moving more throughout the day, your fluid is going to be more evenly distribute it such that when you lay down at night, it is not a big shock to your system and especially your airways in this part that there's suddenly all this new fluid here. Okay, it is more resilient and it's not having extra pressure here in the form of this rostral fluid shift. And then you have less stuff pressing down your airway. Easy one. The last part here is going to be what happens at a cellular level. That's another story for another day, but really briefly, the health of your cells will also dictate how you're breathing and sleeping at night. If you have healthier cells from exercise, guess what? You're gonna breathe better, and you're also gonna have deeper quality sleep and start to reverse some of these comorbidities, whether that is having cholesterol issues piling up in your arteries, high blood pressure, and many more. So that's why exercise is indeed important. Now, like I said, there are top mistakes. There are top things to do right with exercise. This is why it may not have worked for you super well in the past. The reason for this is because of this general itis that happens where we do exercise, but without a certain outcome in mind. Exercise always has an outcome. Everything you do always has an outcome. You don't just run just to run. You may want to do it to improve your endurance. You may want to do it for weight loss. You may want to do it for sleep benefits. The same tool, exercise or running, as an example, has different outcomes. And the biggest mistake people make is using exercise for the sake of fitness rather than for sleep. Yes, there's overlap. Duh. But you can actually change the timing, the intensity, what you're doing, all of that to make sure the tool of exercise is being aimed at better breathing and better sleep. This is why when you try to do this stuff and it doesn't really help because it's not properly aimed at breathing and sleep. That being said, we're going to talk about three different categories. When's the best time to do each and what that actually looks like. So it's pretty simple. We're going to talk about aerobic resistance and high intensity. Now, aerobic is like running or walking. We don't need to be running a marathon all the time. It can just be walking. Resistance training is using things like weight or body weight to build muscle. And then high intensity interval training can be a blend of the two. It could be sprints. It could be using weights and doing a lot of reps in a short amount of time for high intensity. We'll go over each of these because they all have their own benefit in terms of your sleep. So the research has shown aerobic exercise, just like a morning walk, doesn't need to be complicated. Morning walk or some resistance training in the morning will actually help with melatonin release at night. That is super duper important because melatonin is your sleep hormone. So if you do something at the right time, like aerobic or resistance training in the morning, helps with melatonin, helps you with your sleep at night. Now, the next time would be in the afternoon with high intensity interval training. This is when people start to feel the most tired and actually doing a lot of resistance training or a lot of aerobic activity in the afternoon will be more draining. 
So you want to be able to have something that, yeah, it's going to be harder, but you're doing it for less time to stimulate your body in the right way. So if you do some high intensity interval training, again, we'll talk about exactly what that looks like in a few moments around the afternoon time, like four or 6 p.m., that's going to be the best for you. Now, the last one is light resistance training or aerobic exercise. This is not complicated stuff, just as shown in the picture. Maybe it can be yoga, a walk, Pilates, something that is around 8 p.m., somewhat close to bed. Now, I want to caution you. If you know working out that close to bed will hurt your sleep, don't do it. Everyone's individual. Everyone has an individual response. Yet, the research is clear that doing some amount of light activity around 8 p.m., so within two hours of bedtime, can improve your sleep quality as well. So that's the best time of day for these activities. Now, what the heck are these activities going to be? We'll go through these one by one, but first, our red tape here. Too many times in society, we're taught or it's shown to us on a Nike ad or something, you just gotta push it and work really hard and all that. Like, yeah, that's true to an extent, but when your body is in a state of disease, and if you have sleep apnea, sorry, it is, pushing it too much will actually hurt your body more than it helps it. Because exercise by itself is not good for your body. It's our body's response to it. I'll say that again. Exercise by itself is not good. It's our body's response to it. Because if you exercise too hard, too long, etc., it can wear out your nervous system, it can hurt your sleep, it can break down your muscles and your body can't repair them enough. Too much stress on the system without the body's ability to respond to that stressor. So when thinking of exercise, start low. Be humble, set the bar so you can easily win with that. And a little saying here is exercise to stimulate, not to annihilate. And now's the time to remind ourselves that the best results we're seeing with aerobic and resistance training together in unison. You can do this in two ways. You can combine and have a routine of aerobic and resistance training, or you can be super sneaky and super efficient and use high intensity almost exclusively. Nonetheless, aerobic exercise routine. Again, pretty simple. And you wanna focus on making this something refreshing for you. So this could be just brisk walking, cycling, swimming, just a few times a week. Pretty simple, nothing crazy here. It's not more push it, like do 60 minutes, etc. So just pick something from this chart. And honestly, I think the brisk walking once a day, or also you can split it up twice a day. Because like I said, there's different time periods where each of these are optimal. So you don't have to do one 30 minute session. You can do 15 minutes in the morning. You can do 15 minutes in the evening. Simple as that. So go ahead and pick which one you're gonna do and what days. If we don't put a day on the calendar where we're gonna do things, it gets put off to the next day, the next day, and the next day. So just pick a day. If I'm clapping, this is the New Jersey in me. This is how we communicate important things from New Jersey. Uh, and don't worry, I've made it out of New Jersey and can make fun of it because I'm now in a different state, Florida. Number two, resistance training. Once again, you do not need to be competing for CrossFit. Simple things like body weight or dumbbells or even machines. You don't need to become a power lifter here in overcoming this. Just pick something that works for you and how that would look usually two to three times a week. And if you're new to this, just go with twice per week. And it doesn't need to be crazy. I like to think of it in three main ways. Legs, upper body push, upper body pull. And that's what is represented with the dumbbells here. So a dumbbell bench press, dumbbell rows, dumbbell lunges, so on and so forth. And it doesn't need to be a whole lot, just three sets, eight to 12 reps is a good range. And that's it, two or three times a week, do something like that. You could also replicate something with body weight. You could do push-ups, not shown in here, but pull-ups. And if doing eight to 12 reps for three sets of pull-ups is out of the question, you can use a resistance band to make it easier. And then you can do body weight squats. You can also add in some core work as well. Super easy. This is something that if you do a set, you rest one to two minutes, do another set, rest one to two minutes. You do that for three exercises. That's like 20 minutes. And again, it doesn't need to be like barbells and everything, just light active movement. Cause those studies were doing pretty simple exercises. 
nothing crazy. They were even using machines, which I know some people are like, ugh, those don't do anything. A simple stimulus goes a long way in helping your body. Now, last one is high intensity interval training or H-I-I-T. And how this best works is picking something that really works for your body. So I understand some of you may be 65, 75 and burpees is not gonna be appropriate <laughs> for you if you have knee issues, right? So picking something, whether it's jumping jacks or running in place and having your knees come up and hit your hands or around up near your belly button or doing mountain climbers where you put your hands like you're in a push-up position then just bring your knees up that way. It's just finding something that really works for you. And one thing that's probably the easiest on the joints, unless you have lower back issues, is a kettlebell, like a kettlebell swing could also be very helpful. Or you could also use an exercise bike if you have that available to do some high intensity interval training. No matter how you do it, how it would look is just 30 on, 30 off, and do that about like four times, do that for four cycles, and then just do that about two or three times a week. Start with two, and then over time, if you want, get up to three times a week. And how would this all work together? Now, how would this all work together? Just start with picking your aerobic days, and then put the resistance training, depends on how you're responding to the aerobic exercise. Let's say your aerobic exercise is an easy walk, not a big deal. Okay, you could have a day where you have walking and resistance training the same day, you're fine. However, let's say you're doing swimming and that's very vigorous for you. Well, you may not want to do swimming and then a bunch of dumbbell lunges the same day. You would want to have them on different days. And if you're going to use high intensity interval training, then I would not do the aerobic and then instead do the high intensity training stuff. Still have some level of aerobic activity. Instead of a 30 minute walk, maybe do a 10 minute walk if you're doing hit on the same day or high intensity interval training. So we've covered a lot of exercises to help many different factors metabolically with your body and your sleep, helping yourself hormonally as well. Now these exercises are gonna be great and can lead to significant improvements. But what if we targeted sleep apnea even more specifically? Because having a holistic approach and using physical activity and exercise is important. But what if we focus our efforts even more on our airway exercises and also breathing patterns? And that's exactly what we're gonna cover in the next. So if that's not available right now, I would have it on screen where you can just click it and go to the episode. If that's not here, make sure you click subscribe. Make sure you click subscribe with the notification bell so that you know when that episode is out and you can catch it. Now, for those of you who don't wanna to wait to get better and you wanna be able to have the most individualized and tailored approach for you and your needs, then what I will wanna offer you is our free one-on-one -on -one evaluation session. That's at ochnow.com forward slash talk. You'll have to enter that into your web browser, write it down, put it in later, whatever works best for you. And once you're there, there'll be a little intake form, fill it out, and then just book your date and time and you're good to go. That's ochnow.com forward slash talk for your free one-on-one -on -one evaluation call only for those who want to be in the fastest track and just completely nip sleep apnea in the bud, get rid of it as quickly and as confidently as possible. So thank you so much for watching and I will see you on the next episode or I'll talk to you soon.